Welcome to the Interaxis channel. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about payments now in Web3. Payments are so uh, important here because really, one of the main reasons to even have money, one of the main reasons to even have a system like this is so we can pay each other for goods and services, so we can pay each other for work done, uh, anything like that. And and if we go back to the history of Bitcoin and why Bitcoin was created, it's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic uh, uh, system to, to pay each other. It's an electronic peer-to-peer -peer payment system. That's why Bitcoin was created. So we're going to talk here about payments and, and Web3 and crypto and what's so important and some of the developments that have happened and, and some of the developments that are coming and why it's important. You know, we, we talk to a lot of financial professionals, of course, financial professionals being financial advisors, accountants, bankers, lawyers, all that. And it's so important that you understand how payments work here and why they're so important and, and why they're working and why it's important for you to understand things like wallets and custody and transactions and smart contracts and such. So we're going to start by going back to what, you know, just payments in general, how we even got here. And I'm not talking about Web3 payments. I'm talking about how we pay for anything. And of course, at, at the very beginning of paying for anything, there's the barter system, right? I have a cow. I wish I could draw. I'm going to exchange my cow for 10 chickens. I don't know if that's a valid exchange. And then I might take five of those chickens and I exchange it to someone else for, you know, plow my field. So this is goods and services, right? So now I'm using these as barters. This works if you're in this very insular community, right, where we can all talk to each other, we all know each other, we have some level of trust here, and we're all we're, we're going to keep all of our uh, farm e equipment, all of our animals, all the things we produce, all of that in, in within our community. As soon as you start branching out, as soon as you go beyond your community, now you have to have some system that uh, allows you to transact with others that maybe not are part of your community. And I know I'm going into the history of money a little bit, and I know I'm not probably doing it justice, but we, we need to get there. So the next step along this journey of how we pay for things, which is important, not maybe not the next step, but a next step and a big step that got us here, because that's really what we care about, to be honest, is cash, which is also known as banknotes. Right. This was a huge, you know, change in, in technology. Of course, you had coins that were minted early on, you know, Greek, Roman, Egyptian. They, they had coins that were minted. But if we can go back to the, the kind of the uh, idea of banknotes, which it, let's talk about, you know, maybe Renaissance times, because this is when it got really important around the, the time of the Renaissance. And I could go to the first national bank of the Medici. Right. And I could go deposit 1,000 pieces of gold. And they are in turn going to give me 1,000 banknotes from the First National Bank of the Medici. Now, when I leave Italy and I go, uh, you know, around the world with my family or I go on a trade or whatever, and I go, well, there's something I'd really like to buy. I'd really like that food or I'd like that shell or, or you know, my wife likes that coat, whatever it might be. I take one of these banknotes and I give it to someone else for whatever good, whatever service there is. Now, the whole reason why this worked is because these banknotes are what's called bearer instruments, meaning anyone who shows up at the First National Bank of Medici with one banknote will get one piece of gold. I've deposited my thousand pieces of gold there and they gave me 1000 banknotes so that I can more easily transfer them. I'm not walking around with a bunch of gold, but anyone who shows up with one of these banknotes gets one piece of gold. That's how it works. That, that's how cash started to work. That's how banknotes started to work. And if you remember, if we, if we fast forward all the way to uh, here in, in the United States, we were on the gold standard. That meant the United States was essentially the issuing bank, the Fed was the, the, the issuing bank, and they had a certain amount of gold in their treasury, in the U.S. Treasury, and they would issue dollars against that gold. And so we couldn't have more dollars than we had gold until the, it was time that we went off the gold standard and said, look, there's enough trust built in the, in the U.S. government that we can issue dollars if we want to, and we don't have to have gold to back it up because there's not enough gold in the world. And that's when you know well, worldwide wealth really skyrocketed. And if you want to really get into it, that's also when a wealth gap really, really, really started to come about. Now, we moved from cash 
right? And, and again, I'm not hitting every point of this, to something like checks. And a check is just a, essentially an IOU, right? I give a check to Ron, so I give him a check, which is a piece of paper that I've written on it and said, I now, I, Ron, I'm, I'm giving you this $100, and on that check I've written, I've signed it, I've written $100 on it, it comes from my bank. Ron has to take that check to his bank, and his bank has to then go ask my bank, does Adam have the money? Right? Did, did Adam have the money in his account? Because his bank doesn't just accept this piece of paper with my signature on it and says, who the hell is this guy, Adam? Right? His bank asked my bank, yes, Adam had the money. We're gonna, Adam had $1,000. We're going to take $100 out of Adam's account. We're going to send it over here. They're going to put it into Ron's account. That's, how, that's where checks came from. Because, again, now I don't, I'm not walking around with a whole bunch of cash, these bearer instruments, right? Now, it, because sometimes that's not safe, sometimes it's just not practical to walk around with those. It's easier to write a check. If I have to pay for something that's you know, more than the amount of cash I would normally have in my wallet, I want to be able to write checks. I want to be able to pay bills. I don't want to send uh, um, you know, ch cash in the mail, all of these things. So checks became these IOUs. The, the good part about checks, again, is they're easily portable. They're not bare instruments, right? If, I don't, if, if someone just gets a blank check of mine that I haven't signed or anything, technically it can't be used. Now, once I sign it, now it can be used. Now I'm basically saying, give whoever this is this amount of money that I've written on there. The bad part, um, uh, of course, about checks is I can write Ron a $100 check, get my goods, and he has to trust that I actually had the money. So if I didn't have the money in my account, I can write all the checks I want. If I didn't have the money to back it up, it doesn't really matter. But this is, is a system. And the, and the important thing, the important thing to remember from a tech perspective, from a money, and, and more importantly, a payment perspective here is at this point, the banks had to develop systems to chat with each other, to talk to each other and make sure that they could interact. Because now they're sending money. for uh, I'm, I'm paying Ron. This might well be me paying a business for something. And the banks now have to develop a system and they develop you know, some technology that allows them to communicate. And this is banks all over the world being able to communicate. And this is where we see ACH and SWIFT and all these other banks being able to communicate because they have to move money. And part of it is based on the fact that now we can write pieces of paper to each other, send them all over the world, and the banks in the background have to make those because really the bank is keeping track of how much I have and the bank is keeping track of how much Ron has, and then the banks all have to coordinate. So this is the beginning of the banks getting together from a tech perspective and saying, how are we going to make sure that we're accounting for what everyone has and that we're moving money around if we have to, such that when $100 leaves Adam's account, it's leaving our bank and going into your bank and going into Ron's account. How do we do that? And that's the tech that, that had to be set up. Okay, after that, we had a few other uh, forward movements when it comes to uh, when it comes to payments. Okay, and again, I, I know I'm just setting this up, and we'll have to go into other videos to go talk about how Web three payments are going to work, probably. But then we had credit cards, right? And with credit cards. The, ni the nice part about credit cards is now I don't have to have pieces of paper. I don't have to write a check for something like, um, you know, my lunch, right? I, I'm not writing a check for that. I can just give them a, a card and they can, you know, swipe the card. In the old days, they would actually call a phone number and, and verify, does Adam have any credit? But the problem with credit cards is this is debt, right? So now we're going from uh, does Adam have this asset to now Adam is going in debt to pay for lunch, technically. I'm outsourcing this. Someone, some other bank is going to pay that. Uh, so the bank is going to pay the restaurant for my lunch right now. And then I am going to have to pay that bank back. And of course, if I pay within a certain number of days, I'm not charged any interest. If it goes over that, then I'm charged interest. And that interest is quite a lot because this bank is taking on an uncollateralized loan. This is a non-collateralized loan, meaning they have no collateral for me other than my credit score. Okay, but what it did is it, it exploded uh, the, the number of, of um, businesses that could accept payments now from, from me and from you because they don't have to worry about checks. 
They can verify immediately. They can get paid sooner. And now it's up to the bank, not up to the restaurant, but up to the bank to make sure that they collect from me. Right. So I'm getting this, you know, potentially short term debt. And, and of course, once we went with credit cards, there's also later it became debit cards that could be used just as well. And you had ended up having this, these payment networks. So this is where you have MasterCard, Visa, American Express that have developed these payment networks that say, we're going to help these merchants. We're going to help these merchants actually collect the payment. We're going to help them create a system that allows them to actually uh, process these payments easily and collect. And by the way, we're going to charge a fee to do it. So Visa, MasterCard, Amex, we're going to charge like two and a half percent for the ability for you to process these credit cards so that Adam can pay for his coffee or his lunch or his dinner or whatever it is quickly and easily using this card that you swipe or you scan or you call in and, and make sure that he has that. And again, more revolutionary aspects. We don't think of it now, but imagine a time before credit cards. Imagine what, what we had to do. It was cash and it was checks. So then on top of those payment networks, now we start developing you know, other solutions like we have Venmo, we have Cash App, we have Zelle. Right, we, we have all those kind of uh, fintech options. And, the, and these, of course, are more retail. In the background, you might have something like uh, Plaid, which, which basically connects uh, accounts. But these are all, uh, I, I should mention, Apple Pay, Google Pay, all of those. These are all just fintech solutions that sit on top of the infrastructure that's already there. This is not really revolutionary. All this does is say now it's easier for me to send you money directly because individuals don't often accept credit cards. So if I need to send someone money, I can send it via Venmo or Zelle. I mean, and this, uh, we, you know, this also blew up with like Stripe and Square and stuff and, and the growth of mobile phones, right? That's where Apple Pay came in. I can use my phone to store information about my credit cards and pay. I can use my phone to scan a QR code, use Venmo and pay for things. I'm, I'm telling you, this is revolutionary at the farmer's market. Now, when I go to the farmer's market, I don't have to carry a whole bunch of cash because everyone accepts Venmo or everyone accepts Venmo. Uh, Zelle or Apple Pay or Square or something like that. And all these vendors now don't have to have a whole bunch of cash there at the farmer's market, which sounds a little silly, but it, it's, a, it, it's a difference maker for them and it's a difference maker for me. There are days where I've walked out of the house and, and you know gone to the store or, or gone somewhere, to take my kids to get food, and I've actually forgotten my wallet. Well, if, as long as I have my phone, I can use Apple Pay or I can use Zelle or Venmo or something. There's some way I can pay that doesn't even require that I have a credit card on me anymore or cash on me anymore. And so that's where we are in payments. But remember, all of these, all of these are just fintech applications that sit on top of bank infrastructure. So when I use Venmo to pay you, it's no different. If I use Venmo to pay Ron $100, it's still Ron's bank. Venmo is just an intermediary. Venmo is the equivalent of a check. Right, it's just Ron's bank checking with Adam's bank to make sure I have the money. Take out, you know, if I have a thousand dollars, take out a hundred, send it over this bank, put it in Ron's account. It's the same thing. It's just technology overlay on top of all this. It's not a revolution. It's just taking advantage of the technology. Now it helps quite a bit, but in the background, you still have banks. You still have banks controlling these pipes. You still, of course, have the, you know, the U.S. government deciding what a, a dollar's worth. But this, th this is still relying heavily on the banks. And if we go back uh, a little bit, and, and in the next video we'll talk about this, but if we go back a little bit and talk about that reliance on the banks to move money, to keep track of what we have and to move it around when we ask their permission, when we ask them to please do so, they still get to institute quite a bit of friction on here. They still get to institute some, some of their friction. We won't pay for, we, we won't make payments on the weekends or nights or something. So when I go use my credit card or I go use Apple Pay or something at the coffee shop on a Saturday, even though that transaction has kind of been completed, technically the coffee shop won't really get their money for a few days. Okay, that 
technically won't happen. There is still some delay there because the banks have decided this is just how we're going to process transactions. This is just how we're going to move money around. Okay, so there are some of those. And they get to impose fees. MasterCard, Visa, American Express get to uh, impose their one, two, two and a half, three percent fees on top of all this. So you might say, okay, the, the coffee shop isn't collecting as much money, but in reality, they've added, on, they've added that on to what I pay for my coffee or what I pay for my lunch. Okay, so there are those extra fees. So we're all paying a little bit extra for the convenience of using this fintech, whether it's credit cards or Apple Pay or, or Venmo or anything. We're paying the convenience fee to be able to use that on top of the current banking system because the banking system says, look, you guys have to use us. We're the only way to, to move money around. Therefore, we get to charge whatever fees we want. We get to create whatever friction we want, and you all have to deal with it. And then that that reliance we had on the banks kind of led to this mortgage crisis, of course, in 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, which brought the world economy to its knees in the Great Recession and caused us to go, wait, why do we trust banks so much when, when they did these things with our money? All this money that we had deposited in there, they went and did risky things with it. They lost a whole lot of money in the world. They all got bailed out. We didn't. We have a problem with this, and Bitcoin was created. So in the next video, we'll talk about Bitcoin and payments and, and how that uh, moves forward and where we are now.